Hi, everybody. This is Diane Yantel. Thanks for joining today's call on coronavirus and housing and homelessness. As always, we have a large number of participants joining. Um, so I'm going to give it another minute or two to allow more people to join before we start with our agenda. So please sit tight. and We'll be back in just about a minute. Thank you. Hi everybody, thanks for joining today's coronavirus and housing homelessness call sponsored by the National Low Income Housing Coalition. We're still, I'm still gonna give it another minute or so since we have such a large number of people joining um, to give some more people a chance to get on before we get started. So we'll start in about one more minute. Hey, hi everybody. This is Diane Yantel. I'm president and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Thank you for joining today's call on coronavirus and housing and homelessness. As always, we have a large number of people joining today's call. We have over 2,000 people registered for the call. Um, and many of the people joining today's call include people experiencing homelessness, low income renters, homeless shelter and service providers, housing developers and providers, advocates, organizers, state, local, and federal policymakers and their staff, and a large number of media join these calls as well. So thank you and welcome to everybody. Uh, appreciate you joining today's call. I also appreciate you continuing to send questions to us, both in advance of the call, we received a couple dozen questions already, and uh, as you hear speakers present, feel free to share your questions as well through the Q&A box on your screen. Um, we, we have um, staff from the team at the National Low Income Housing Coalition that will be answering some of those questions via Q&A and chat as we go. And then some of them I will uh, ask of our presenters to, to answer live during the call. And then we also take the questions that you ask that we're not able to answer on the call and use them to create new FAQs that we post regularly on our website and share out via email with all participants. So do keep sending your questions and one way or another, we'll do our best uh, to get them answered. So we have a really full agenda today, a lot of terrific speakers and I'm grateful to all of them for joining today. And I wanna move into uh, our agenda now and start with our first topic on tracking COVID-19 evictions. And I wanna introduce uh, Matthew Desmond and thank Matt for joining today's call. So Matthew is the Maurice P. Doring Professor of Sociology at Princeton University. He's the author of four books, including Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City, which many of you have read which won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award. And Matt is also the principal investigator of the Eviction Lab. He joined our call several weeks ago, I think it's probably over a month ago now, 
to share with us some of the work that the eviction lab had done to track uh, eviction moratoriums and create a scorecard for eviction moratoriums across the country. So his, he and his team have been hard at work in um, keeping that scorecard updated and also in creating a new way to track the evictions that all of us fear are coming soon as those moratoriums are lifted. So thanks so much, Matt, for your work and thanks for joining us today to talk about um, the tracking tools that you've created and how people can use them and to answer some questions. So Matt, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Diane. And thanks for your leadership and advocacy and good to be with all of you today. I think I can control this screen, but I'm not sure how to flip it now. Um, let's see. Okay, all right. Okay, so I wanted to talk about a new tool that um, the Eviction Lab just launched. Uh, this was a tool that was really dreamed up and executed by uh, Peter Hepburn. Peter has been with the Eviction Lab as a postdoc for the last couple of years, and um, he will be transitioning uh, uh, to be an assistant professor at Rutgers University in Newark uh, this fall. Um, and so I, all the credit for this really goes to Peter, and um, I thank him for his work. He's on this call today as well. So just a quick reminder about evictions before COVID. So uh, by our estimate in the eviction lab, and we've collected millions and millions of eviction records going back to 2000 from uh, all over the country. Um, in 2016, which is our most recent complete uh, data, there are 3.7 million evictions filed in the United States. That's seven evictions filed a minute. Uh, that's an incredible amount of residential instability and insecurity. That number far exceeds the number of foreclosures starts in 2009, which is at the height of the crisis. So eviction already was, was something of a, a giant problem in America before we were in this situation. Um, eviction is widespread. It is not just a problem that's in, you know, high cost cities on the coast, like New York or San Francisco. If you look at some of the highest evicting cities in America, you're talking about Tulsa, Oklahoma, you're talking about Albuquerque, New Mexico, Richmond, Virginia, and even suburban, smaller cities, even rural communities are touched by this problem as well. There's some small towns in America, like in Illinois and Wisconsin, that have eviction rates that rival the eviction rates of our largest cities. And so when we talk about eviction as a problem, we're not talking about a problem that only affects a few really expensive cities or only affects cities in general. We're really talking about a nationwide problem Here's a, a map of Ohio and Pennsylvania, and the purple here is just population. So the deeper the purple, uh, the more densely populated the county is. And the bigger that red dot, that means the eviction rate is bigger. And so you'll see, yes, uh, cities like uh, Cleveland, uh, like Pittsburgh, uh, they do have fairly high eviction rates. But what's shocking to me about these, these large and really important states is that there's non-trivial eviction rates in, in the rural parts of the, 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 the states, in the suburban parts surrounding the cities. And I think this is just really important from a policy perspective and a, a perspective that allows us to tell the story in an accurate way. Okay, so the federal government doesn't collect data on eviction. Um, we don't really have a way of knowing what evictions are doing after uh, and during COVID, uh, and especially after the uh, eviction moratoriums begin to lift. What, where are they gonna spike? How bad are they gonna spike? Um, and, and so what we've released is something we're calling the eviction, tra eviction tracking system. We have about a dozen cities right now where we're tracking evictions on a weekly basis. So we can give kind of a real time update about what insecurity is looking like right now. We would love to add more cities. If you know that we can add your city or your state even, please get in touch with us. We'd love to hear what you think about the tool and, and how you think we can make it better and expand it. So this is live. Uh, you can go to our website right now, evictionlab.org, and you can see these data yourself and download them and interact with them. And I just want to walk you through the tool real quick. So this is kind of the landing page 
of the eviction tracker and it shows uh, the cities we have and it shows eviction filings last week pegged to their baseline. So the baseline is, you know, average evictions in that city during this time period. And, you know, the first thing you notice immediately is the moratorium really did work. It really lowered evictions in the cities we're looking at. But we're noticing these kind of early signs of cities beginning to creep back up with the Rust Belt really leading the way. Milwaukee's evictions are up. And then we just learned uh, today that, that, that Cleveland's evictions are starting to rise as well. We wanted a ticker that kind of clearly conveyed this information. That's why you have kind of a red up or green down arrow here to see what evictions are doing. So if you clicked on view full report by Milwaukee, it kind of takes you in to the city and you learn uh, when the moratorium expired. Uh, you can kind of see the policy behind the, uh, the city's moratorium and you can get kind of a little kind of top order snapshot of what's going on. If you go deeper into it, you kind of are uh, introduced to three kind of tools. This one shows monthly eviction filings relative to the baseline average. And you'll see that 100% is kind of where Milwaukee evictions look like kind of in a normal time. And the, the, it's by month. And if the month isn't over like June, this June is kind of calibrated to how many days you've experienced in June already. And so you'll see in Milwaukee, at least, you had higher than average evictions to start the year. And then the moratorium hit, and it really dropped evictions to, uh, to very low levels. But once that moratorium lifted, evictions shot back up again in Milwaukee. In fact, they, they're 38% uh, up above relative to the average. This is just another way we visualize that with the kind of red bars showing the typical eviction rate uh, filing rate, I should say, in Milwaukee by month, and then the purple showing what it is uh, right now, given the most up-to-date information we can process. We also wanted to map where evictions are kind of higher than average and, and normal or lower than average in the cities. And so this is what Milwaukee looks like right now. Um, if you see purple, that means the deeper the purple, the evictions are actually lower than average in those communities. And the darker the red means evictions are higher than average. And for those of you on the call that know Milwaukee, this is pretty interesting. You know, I think it's interesting because what you're seeing here is that evictions are not spiking where they're most concentrated in the city, which is on the north side of the city, which is those kind of blocks right above the word Milwaukee. That's where most evictions happen in, in the city. But what you're seeing now is that evictions seem to be spiking in places like West Dallas. This is traditionally a kind of a working class white area of Milwaukee or on the far south side, which again is kind of a more working class uh, white community. Or on the east side, which is more of a kind of college educated uh, community of, around uh, the university. And so I think it's important that we understand the hotspots of eviction because it gives us more precise policy interventions. Um, so that's kind of, and there's one more tool that I don't, I don't think it made it in this cut, but, um, but it shows uh, the racial demographics of neighborhoods and it allows us to see how evictions are deepening racial disparities uh, in, uh, in the cities that we look at too. I wanna to thank Peter uh, for all his help on this. I want to thank Elisa Durana, who's our narrative change liaison at the Eviction Lab. Um, and I think that's it for me. Um, and I'm really looking forward to your questions and feedback. And again, if you have anything, um, have any feedback for us, please, uh, please feel free to reach out. Great. Thanks so much, Matt. And thanks uh, to everybody on your team for creating another very useful tool for us to understand um, how evictions are increasing and to help policymakers think of solutions. So um, uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, I think to start with, can you talk about uh, why and how you chose the cities that you're tracking? Sure, it was really, um, it was really by necessity. You know, not all the cities uh, have court systems that are updated weekly that allow us to access them over, over the internet and, and provide fairly comprehensive data. So on the one hand, it was just like, we wanted to get what we could get. 
And then on the other, we wanted to have cities that do give us a regional picture. So we have cities um, on the East Coast, in the, in the Midwest, on the West uh, Coast, and, and in the South. And so we wanted to have variation. But uh, again, like we can add any city that, that has the data available, um, and we'd be interested and keen to, to expand. Okay, that's great, because that was another question that's come in from a few people asking if you would be willing to add additional cities or how people can go about um, connecting with you. And I see that Aliza has put into the chat box um, an email address that people can reach out to for that. So that's very helpful. Um, there's a question um, around how you see the impact of, of evictions on segregation. And if you can talk a little bit about the racial disparities and the disproportionate impact of the coming evictions on people of color and what that will mean for communities. Right, so you know the story of, of eviction um, in, before COVID hit uh, was the old American story of racism and racial inequality. I mean, you can see the history of the systematic dispossession of, of people of color and African Americans in particular from the land, that history is still bearing out um, in the lives of folks today because things are not concentrated in gentrifying communities uh, or transitioning communities are really concentrated in low-income African-American communities. You know, um, Black and Latino families, uh, most of those families are renters in the country, unlike most white families. So they're exposed to eviction just by that sheer fact too. So when we think about that, and then we think about how COVID is disproportionately affecting um, African-American communities and African-American businesses, you'll remember that like most African-American businesses didn't survive the foreclosure crisis and the, the economic fall there. So I, think that, um, so I think that the baseline has worrying trends. And then when it combines with the pandemic, it's, it's very worrying. So I think that you know, eviction doesn't look like a causation, but eviction certainly looks like something that is guided and propelled by segregation. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of questions coming in now. I'm just trying to um, compile and ask us the ones that are um, most asked or most pertinent. Um, so somebody is asking, what percentage of eviction filings actually end up, end up in a renter being forced to move out? I don't know that question off the top of my head. Peter, do you know the question, that answer off the top of your head? Um, in terms of filings to judgment, it's, um, it's usually about 50%, a little above 50. Okay, thanks. And uh, you showed earlier a map that showed that the eviction rate in rural areas is higher. And somebody is asking if that is because the percentage of renters is lower. Yeah, I think that's, that's part of it. But it's, it's, not, it's not that evictions are higher in rural areas necessarily. It's just that they're there. And I think for me, that's, that's a really important point because I think that in the national media and in Washington to a degree, the housing crisis is often pitched as a coastal issue. And if it's not a coastal issue, it's, a, it's an urban issue. And if you look at rents, you can see why that story kind of is rooted in. But if you look at evictions, you see, man, this, this, this crisis is, is hitting us all over the place. So it's not that, that the rural community is more the eviction rate is necessarily higher. It's just that it's there. And when the, the eviction rates are higher, there is, a, there is something to that uh, denominator issue, small, small denominator, yeah. Okay. And are you, are you including uh, evictions from mobile home parks in your eviction rates? Yes. Okay. Um, a question on, going back to the question around people who want to have their cities represented in the tracking that you're doing, what data do you need to add additional cities? Peter, can you take that? Yeah, sure. Um, so we would need to have, um, uh, <coughs> sorry, I've got my infants on here. Uh, we, we would need to have um, uh, the ability to capture 
um, new filings from online court systems on a weekly basis. Um, and um, so that means that we'll, and we'll need to have some sort of address information uh, as a part of those filings too. Um, so there's been great work that's going on in Oklahoma right now uh, in the, the Oklahoma Court Tracker Program uh, that's been able to do this at the county level. Uh, but unfortunately, um, in that instance, uh, they, they don't have address information. So that's one of those places where we can't, can't yet expand, but we're hoping to move forward with that eventually. Okay, thanks, Peter, and congratulations on your baby. Um, there's a question around whether um, the figures that you're using, are they based on formal evictions or do they also include informal evictions? They're only formal evictions. It's only through the court system. You know, the best data we have on informal evictions are from survey data. And so they're, you know, by the time you get that number, you know, the, the evictions have already long gone and happened. Um, so you're right. So even a number we see in a surge that we see, we have to keep in mind that that's an underestimate. In Milwaukee, right. we have data on informal evictions showing that they're on informal evictions. In New York, it's the opposite. New York City, it's the opposite. And I think it, it reflects in part the, the rights tenants have in, in those two cities. Yeah, and somebody from Massachusetts is um, suggesting that maybe a way to track the it, informal or, or the illegal lockouts are to look for court filings in which tenants are challenging those illegal lockouts. Is that something that you all are doing or thinking of doing? No, but I'd have, let me think more about that. That seems interesting, yeah. Okay, and also a question about um, how and when you are going to be releasing information about evictors and who, who, are, who are the landlords that are doing the most evicting and where. So this is something uh, we're working on. I, I know Just Fix NYC as a tool uh, for this in New York City. I know Enterprise Community Partnerships has also been working on um, a project related to this. You know, uh, I, I can't, uh, we don't have a launch date for that yet. You know, it's, um, that's, a, that's a complicated, that's a complicated one to get right because all the, the use of LLCs and other kind of company names that can kind of hide and include ownership. And so um, I, we are considering dividing public um, housing evictions uh, from private market evictions. So I think they have different policy implications in this tracker. Um, we're definitely interested in thinking about uh, that exact problem about ownership, um, but we're, you know, like we're kind of working around the clock on that and it, it's gonna take a while. I do think from a policy perspective, this, that's a hugely important question because when it comes to addressing evictions, identifying high evicting buildings and high evicting property owners can give us, I think, a more precise and maybe efficient response to COVID evictions than kind of a blanket response. Mm -hmm. um, somebody's asking uh, what, in your view, what would it take to have a national database on evictions and how would having that kind of a database help? Well, I think that it would take uh, passing the Eviction Crisis Act, which was a bipartisan piece of legislation that was introduced in the Senate in December, you know, which feels like several years ago, but it was just introduced. And it had support on both sides of the aisle. And one thing that that bill would do would be to establish um, a database in HUD, I believe it was in HUD, that would allow us to track evictions na nationwide. Now, why do we need that information? I think it's hugely important for a ton of reasons. For, first, like we could uh, build in evictions as a evaluative tool for HUD, right? So you could say, how many evictions are you doing every year in your public housing authority? And that could be actually be used to grade those authorities. It's not now. So high and low eviction PHAs are, look the same to HUD. I think they shouldn't. I think PHA should be, you know, the standard bearer for affordability and stability for low income communities. It also can help us understand, you know, what policies are working around the country 
what cities have high and low eviction rates, and it can help us push the narrative forward. You know, if every year the country is, um, is experiencing evictions, not by the hundreds of thousands, but by the millions, it keeps that, you know, closer to the top of the domestic agenda. So I just think, you know, we're designing policy in the dark with eviction, and this is a problem that's too crucial for us not to keep track of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I th we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you one last question live and then um, ask if we can follow up with you to get answers to all of the other questions that have been coming in. But there's, there's a lot of questions about uh, the reason for the evictions and if you're tracking that and if you can say, you know, what percentage of the eviction filings are for non-payment of rent and what some of the other causes might be. That's a really hard thing to track um, in the data. And I mean, that question also speaks to the, the, the necessity for having good data uh, on evictions. You know, um, we know from previous work that a non-trivial amount of evictions around the country are for uh, less than a month's worth of rent by our estimate, and it's a rough estimate, by our estimate it's about a third of all evictions that we've looked at are for less than a month's worth of rent, which means you know, one in 10 evictions in, in Virginia, for example, in 2016 were for less than $335. So even when you have, you know, evictions for payments, you're often having, you know, eviction for very little money and certainly a lot less than it would take to intervene in, a, in a, an effective way. Um, I think that, you know, it's also just tricky from a court document point of view, you know, even a, an eviction for non-payment Often, this is what I saw in court when I was spending time with tenants and landlords in Milwaukee, and something that you advocates know already, it's just, you know, it could be non-payment, but it can also be non-payment plus, you know, you took on an unauthorized border, a non-payment plus you got pregnant, or non-payment plus, you know, you're, you know, you're being accused of illegal activity or something like that. But I think that even data like that, right, like a, a piece of information like that in the court often doesn't tell the whole story. Sorry for that rambling answer, which is like, we're trying, we're working, but it's really hard to get. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And actually, I'm just gonna ask you one last one, um, which is whether um, you've been thinking about sort of doing an overlay of where there are local rent relief programs and with the cities that you're tracking um, on eviction rates to see if the rent relief programs are having a positive impact in reducing the number of evictions. Do you think they're dosed enough for us to see the data respond? You know what I mean? Like, you know, uh, yeah, I think, well, I think we should talk about that. Actually, we're, we're starting to track um, all of the rent relief programs that existed pre COVID and the 140 plus rent relief programs at the state and local level that have been created since. Um, and we're starting to dig into each of those rent relief programs. So I think there's not yet, but in time, I think there will be. And I think it would be interesting to match them up and see That's what the impacts idea. are. That's a good idea. Thank you. Okay, so we, ha we have a lot more questions, but we're out of time. So thank you, Matt, so much for joining. I'd love to follow up with you on some of the other questions that came in so we can send out answers to them afterwards. Um, and thanks again for, for all your great work and you for joining too. today. Thank you so much for having us. And everyone, please feel free to reach out to us. Thanks. Great, thanks, Matt. Okay, so I'm gonna turn now to our and, and just to say too, thank you all for, for being so active in that conversation. We do try to answer as many questions as we could. There's probably at least a dozen or more questions that we couldn't answer. So we will follow up with Matt and his team and work on getting some of those questions answered and we'll send those out um, in follow-up information. So I wanna turn to our next speaker, which is Kathy Alderman with the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless to talk about a pilot program that they did on COVID-19 testing for unsheltered homeless people in Colorado. So Kathy, I'll turn to you. Great, Diane, thank you. And thank you, um, Matt, that was a great presentation. So we um, had earlier in the Denver metro area done a, a pilot test among both sheltered and unsheltered people at a um, day shelter. And we found a prevalence rate of COVID-19 among asymptomatic individuals of about 26%. And 
that was reduced to 20% after we eliminated inconclusive results. Um, but we figured, you know, with 20% asymptomatic carriers um, among that population, we really needed to understand what the prevalence was among um, our unsheltered community. And so we picked a day to do um, testing and the way we devised it is we did outreach in advance. So education to the community to let them know that testing was gonna be available. We provided incentives for people to both get tested and to come back and get their results. And that was critical um, because obviously um, unsheltered folks um, move around and we wanted to make sure that we got those re results back to them. And we needed test test results that would come back quickly. So we worked with our state lab to make sure we could get results within 24 hours. We conducted the testing in, in partnership with Denver Public Health and the Department of Public Health and Environment who actually did the test. We got those results back. We tested 50 individuals and there were zero positive results. Uh, eight individuals were identified as high risk, meaning that they had a pre-existing condition that would make them more likely to require hospitalization or critical care if they got the virus. And so we were able to move seven of those eight people into motel, hotel spaces uh, for isolation to keep them from coming in contact with the virus. 16 of the individuals that we tested actually had symptoms that were indicative of potential COVID. And so um, I think what that demonstrates is that although all of those tests came back negative, that the folks living on the streets do have some pretty serious health concerns and do have issues that we need to continue to address by providing healthcare services um, and supplies out on the streets. We think that the results of this test really help to make the case that during the crisis response, while we are dealing with COVID-19, we need to leave people in the places where they are safe. And while people may be safe from contracting COVID on the streets, we know that there are other risks that come with living outside. And so we need to provide ways to protect people from those risks while not moving them around and potentially exposing them or spreading the virus further. Some of the high risk conditions that we know existed on the streets included diabetes, COPD, high blood pressure, asthma, and heart disease. And so those people we know, if they contract the virus, they are gonna be much more likely to require critical care or hospitalization. And so we need to remove those people from the, any setting to make sure that they can be safely isolated from the virus. Uh, again, I wanna, I wanna emphasize that this was a test of one camp um, of you know, 50 individuals. We are working to try to provide additional testing at other camps so that we can confirm these results. But I do think that it helps to make the case that we need to leave people where they are, where they are currently safe from the virus, provide them with sanitation supplies, restrooms, and uh, security and safety, and then um, work to get them into to housing in the long term. We need not to be moving people around and subjecting them to potential exposure, especially with the health conditions that we're seeing in this population. That's all I have to report out today. I will put a link to the, um, to the results in the chat box so that you can have that. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email is on the slide and I'd be happy to talk about our testing efforts moving forward. Great, thanks so much, Kathy. And I know you have to run, but maybe one question before you do, sure. if you have time. Okay, so a question, um, you had mentioned that there were seven out of eight that you tested were, were higher risk and that you were able to get them into hotels and motels. Can you talk about um, what funding you, were, you used to be able to do that and, and what are the plans for those people um, when the funding for the hotel rooms ends? Sure, so we've been in partner with uh, the city of Denver uh, at the beginning of this response in March in acquiring hotel motel spaces um, for two purposes. The first is to give people who have tested positive and need a place to recover but don't have a home to recover in a place to do that. And so we refer to that as activated respite. And basically those are COVID positive facilities. The second is for high risk individuals who if they get the virus are gonna re likely require hospitalizations. And we refer to that as protective actions. So in, in acquiring all of these hotel and motel spaces, that is an eligible expense under um, the FEMA reimbursement. 
And so FEMA will essentially reimburse the city who will reimburse us for housing um, these individuals. The contracts that we have with different motels and hotels vary. Some of them will um, end at the end of July, some at the end of August. We do have options to renew those, and we are working very closely with the city right now to implement a rehousing strategy to make sure that we don't release people from these motels and hotels back to the streets or back into shelter, especially those high-risk individuals who are really susceptible to complications if they contract the virus. So we have a little bit of city funding, um, and then we have some CARES Act funding that's also going to come in that we will be able to use for short-term but longer-term um, vouchers than what how we're currently paying for these hotel and motel stays. Okay, great. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks so much for joining today's call. Sure, thank you. Um, and just a reminder uh, in terms of what Kathy mentioned around FEMA reimbursing cities and states to put people experiencing homelessness into non-congregate settings like hotels that we have a few um, materials and toolkits available on our website to explain how that works, what FEMA can cover. And we have one document called Getting to Yes that the team at NLIHC put together around um, tracking which states and localities have these reimbursement agreements with FEMA when they expire and how other cities and states um, can learn from those places to also get FEMA to agree to pay for the hotel rooms for people experiencing homelessness and other people in congregate shelters in their communities. So you can find those materials on our website. Okay, I'm gonna turn now to our next speaker and our next topic. Um, the speaker is Roxy Keynes from Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and she's gonna talk about their analysis of the economic impact payments um, and how and who they've gone to. And Roxy joined our national call probably about a month or maybe six weeks ago um, to talk about some of the work that they were doing to make sure that those EIP payments got out as broadly as possible. So I'm so glad, Roxy, to have you back on today to talk about what you've learned and what more people can do. So I'll turn it over to you, Roxy. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for having me back and thank you for the great work that you and everyone joining this call are doing. So I want to share some updates about economic impact payments and why outreach is needed and who we really need to target outreach efforts to. On the next slide, you will see uh, I'm not able to advance the slide. Um, okay, Rex, may I can oh, you okay. advance? Oh, okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So on the next slide here, you can see a snapshot of why outreach is needed. Uh, last week, the center released a paper on who are the non-filers for economic impact payments. And we learned that about 12 million people are non-filers, meaning they weren't, aren't eligible to receive automatic payments. People are getting automatic payments based on filing a tax return and participating in certain federally administered programs. So of this 12 million population, we know that as many as 9 million people participate in SNAP or Medicaid. And so that means an estimated 3 million people are not connected to any of these programs. So outreach is needed, one, because the payments are a significant amount of money. Uh, $1,200 is the base level and it can be more for families. And we see how this automatic payment delivery system, while it has reached many people and there were a lot of efforts to help expand who would get the automatic payments, there are still people who are not getting that and who won't know about it or won't know what to do. Uh, with outreach, there's also an opportunity to answer questions that may prevent people from even attempting to sign up. So some people are concerned about not not having a permanent mailing address or not having an email address to actually complete the online form. Some people are concerned because they don't have a bank account. So 
outreach efforts can help to address these questions and help people know that they can still get the payment and that they're eligible for it. One of the great things about this payment is that there is no minimum income required to get it. So that means that people with no income or very low incomes um, can really benefit from the payments. And so there are different ways to participate in outreach. Uh, some people will be able to spread the word out through different channels and some people may be in a position to actually help people complete the form online. And while the form is a simplified version of a tax return, it still can be intimidating and complex for some people um, who are not used to using, um, who, are not, who are not tax filers. So in the paper we released, um, we learned a little bit more about this 9 million population of non-filers. And so some of the characteristics, just to paint a bit of a, a more detailed picture, is one, we know that this is a group that has very low incomes. Um, this group is primarily non-elderly because most people, most senior citizens are getting their payments automatically. So of the 12 million, about 1 million would be sen senior citizens. Uh, nearly 50% are people of color and nearly 40% are people not raising children in the home. And this includes people that um, could be low income students, they could be people with limited job skills, um, people with disabilities, and also some youth who are aging out of foster care. And then also we know that this population is experiencing a lack of secure housing. So these are reasons why outreach is needed. And so what we've done, uh, the center's outreach campaign known as the Get It Back campaign has put together some outreach resources and materials. So our timeline right now, people have until October 15th to file to get their payment this year. The payment will still be available next year, but the process is not determined yet. The IRS has not determined will people have to file a full tax return or if they will develop a new non-filer tool. So we really want to help make sure that people can get their payments this year. And we have developed different outreach materials and resources. So um, one page is geared towards individuals and that's the eitcoutreach.org slash stimulus page, which gives an overview on eligibility and how to claim the payment. The other resource is for advocates and that is the slash coronavirus link. And that one, uh, has many different resources that I'll, I'll share a screenshot of shortly. Um, and then our paper that came out, it includes state level data as well. So you don't just have to go off of this 12 million number, you can get a number of um, estimated people and estimated amount of impact payments that is for your state. And we are having an outreach webinar on tomorrow uh, that will share more about tools and strategies that people can use. So we're having six different people present. It's not just our information. So if you are interested in outreach, I encourage you to join that and I will put the link in the chat. Um, this is a snapshot of the slash coronavirus page. When you go to it, you'll see we have all of our resources in one place. So the research includes the link to the paper I mentioned. There's also um, a shorter piece geared towards what TANF agencies can do to help with outreach. And then there's one for SNAP agencies as well. And we'll be releasing one specifically for housing groups and for um, health agencies. We have links to our FAQs, and then we also have materials that you can use. So we have an outreach flyer. Um, 
including one that is customizable. And this week we'll be posting it in five different languages. We also have sample social media posts that can be used as well as templates for different forms of communication, email, blog, website text, talking points, and press release. And this is a quick snapshot of the slash stimulus uh, payment site. So there's more to it, but you can see it's more visual and has less text so that it is more friendly to individuals. So we really hope that people will use these resources and see what you can do in your community. There's also a guide to getting started with outreach. And one of the things is that it encourages people to start to find out what's happening locally. And so we have some guidance on how to do that. Um, so we really hope that these resources will be useful to you. And if there's something missing that you would find beneficial, please let me know. We're constantly creating new resources and updating what we have. We will be posting something on tips for virtual outreach, and we'll also be posting a guide to completing the non-filer form. So this is especially useful for groups that are able to help assist people in completing the form. So thank you. Roxy, thanks so much. This is a really helpful um, update and really helpful information. We do have a couple questions if you have time. Um, yes. Okay, great. Uh, there's actually several questions asking about how people can track for themselves or for people that they work with, um, people who should be eligible, who um, haven't received their payment, where they can track where their payment is in the process. Yes, so the IRS has uh, created a tool for tracking the status of payments. It's called Get My Payment. And so that would be the best place to see um, what's happening with someone's payment. It will either say the date of when it is has been sent out or um, if it's being processed or if there's information missing, it will give some clues to um, the status of the payment. Okay, great. And a question on if the IRS is working to create a phone option for people to, who don't have internet access. And they give the example in New Orleans, 20% of people don't have internet and the libraries are closed. So how can people um, access these payments without the internet? Yes, so to my knowledge, the IRS is not working on that option. Um, there's a number of uh, issues and concerns that, while I brought this up before, I believe last time someone asked that question too, um, it's not something that they're able to put into place like in the next couple of months. So for people who don't have internet access, this is where the uh, step of learning what's happening and what's available locally is really helpful. So there are some organizations, including some that provide free tax filing assistance that are offering help and assistance in different ways. Um, on our webinar tomorrow, we're going to have someone from Washington State who is sharing the outreach that they've been doing, uh, street outreach, setting up tables and helping people to get their payments that way. So um, there may be some other local options, but in terms of an alternative to actually using the internet to file the form, unfortunately, there's not an alternative right now. Okay, thanks. And there's some people have been typing into the chat box um, some suggestions and ideas that they've been using in their communities. So I encourage people to read that and we'll, we'll do our best to compile it and send it back out also as follow up. But, and Roxy, there's quite a few questions coming in, but we're running out of time. So I'd love to follow up with you to get answers to some of these questions to send them back out. But um, one last question or suggestion is whether these resources that you've created are offered in different languages. 
So right now, everything on the site is only available in English. We do have a one pager. Uh, well, it's really a front and back like two pager that gives an overview of who's eligible for the payments and answers some uh, common questions. And that will be available in five languages. We've had it translated into Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Tagalog and Vietnamese. And so that should be posted to the site by the end of this week. Okay, great. That's terrific. Thanks, Roxy, so much. And please do um, either put in the chat box or send to the NLIHC team the link and the information for tomorrow's webinar, and we'll be sure to get that out to people as well. Thank you. Thanks, Roxy. Okay, next topic is to talk about HUD's latest attempt um, to allow shelter providers to refuse shelter to LGBTQ people during and after COVID-19 and what some of the many harmful impacts of that will be and what you can do. Um, so for that topic, I'm really glad to welcome uh, Dylan Wagaspak from True Colors United uh, to talk about that. So Dylan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Diane, um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so yeah, HUD is preparing to publish their proposed anti-transgender rule, which would roll back the protections that were put into place in 2016 with the HUD Equal Access Rule. Um, so this proposal would seek to make compliance uh, with transgender non-discrimination protections optional, uh, in essence, in HUD-funded programs. Um, so under this proposal, service providers would be allowed to make what they are describing as good faith assumptions about a person's sex assigned at birth and then refuse them services outright if they only serve people of a single sex or require them to access services with people of a different gender if they're sex segregated. Um, we're expecting this rule to be published in the Federal Register in about a week, uh, which is when we'll be kicking off our campaign to preserve these protections in earnest. Um, and that campaign is called Housing Saves Lives. Uh, True Colors United is partnering with the National Center for Transgender Equality and another, a number of other organizations, both in this housing and homelessness advocacy and service space, um, including the National Low Income Housing Coalition and the LGBTQ equality space um, in order to drive public comments in opposition to this anti-transgender rule. Um, and anyone who is, is interested or invested in this can visit housingsaveslives.org right now to see who our partners are. Um, and if you'd like to sign your organization up as a partner to help drive those public comments, you can send me an email at dylan, D-Y-L-A-N, at truecolorsunited.org. Um, and we'd also invite you to go ahead and start sharing this website with your audiences so that they can sign up to participate in this campaign as individuals, which will give us the ability to reach out to them when the comment period opens to help them draft and submit a public comment. Um, in, in terms of, of the impact of this rule and, and, and our concerns, you know, obviously discrimination is never okay, uh, but we are particularly concerned about this rule in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, since emergency shelters can be such an important point of access for people experiencing homelessness to those individual housing solutions. Um, and those are so critical to pe keeping people safe and healthy right now, as everyone on this webinar knows. So we know that transgender individuals are already more likely to be unsheltered than people experiencing homelessness who are not transgender. And we know that a huge huge part of that is fear of facing discrimination or even violence in accessing services. Um, what I do want to make sure is clear today is that it is absolutely illegal to deny a transgender person services or to force them to access services with people of a different gender than themselves. Um, meaning a transgender woman, so someone assigned male at birth who is a woman, must be allowed to access services with women and vice versa. Um, and because I know this, this question is coming up for a lot of us, I'll also say we're not prepared yet to speak on the implications of last week's Supreme Court decision on the Title VII sex discrimination protections and employment, um, but you will start seeing information on that included in our talking points once we're, once we're ready to, to speak on that. And I'll hand it back to you, Diane. Okay, Dylan, thanks so much for that. And thank you for joining. We did have a question that you already answered around the Supreme Court. So we'll look out for that analysis. Um, but just want to 
underscore how harmful and wrong this proposal is and how much the National Income Housing Coalition is committed to working with our partners to defeat it. Um, so I just want to encourage everybody to go, as Dylan said, to housingsaveslives.org um, to keep checking back onto that web page for new materials. And we'll certainly on this call alert everybody when it's time to start uh, writing those comments opposing this harmful proposal from, from moving forward. So Dylan, thanks again for your work on this and thanks so much for joining. Thank you. So um, before I introduce our next speaker, I just want to jump back for a second onto the, um, the, the conversation around economic impact payments because I meant to but forgot to mention that uh, we also have some materials on that on our web page. Kim Johnson from the policy team pulled together an overview that's specifically guidance for helping people who are experiencing homelessness to access their economic impact payments. Um, so you can find that on the website. We'll put a link to that on in the chat box. But in addition to a general overview of the EIP uh, and how people can access it, um, Kim was able to gather from some of our partners in Alabama, Ohio, Florida, DC, Oregon, Nevada, and Illinois, what kind of specific outreach they're doing to make sure that people who are experiencing homelessness receive those payments. So you can check out those examples and consider doing similar outreach in your communities. If you have other examples, we'd love to hear them. So please reach out to Kim or anybody on the NLHC team to share those and we'll update that document with those examples. Okay, so our next, we're gonna go back to the topic of uh, evictions and we're gonna hear next from Glare, Gary Blasey, who's with UCLA Luskin Institute on Inequality and Democracy to talk about some projections that they've done around impending eviction and homelessness in Los Angeles. So Gary, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, thank you um, and good afternoon everyone. I'm going to be speaking specifically about um, Los Angeles County, which has a population of about 10 million. Well before the COVID crisis, LA was already in the deepest of crises of uh, any community in the United States with respect to homelessness. Our last homeless count, which came out last week, has 66,000 uh, unhoused uh, people uh, in LA County. Uh, last year, one in five unsheltered homeless people in the United States were in Los Angeles County. And long before COVID-19, about 600,000 people were in households paying 90% of their income on rent. Um, recently, I've been working with the UCLA Institute on Inequality and Democracy on a project, uh, our goal for which is, uh, number one, to alert state and local government to the scale of the pending massive increase in homelessness as a result of evictions, and also to propose policy and organizing solutions to prevent or reduce evictions and deal with what will otherwise become modern Hoovervilles or camps for economic refugees of this new crisis on top of all the crises that preceded it. Um, our first step uh, in doing that was to estimate the number of evictions we can expect. And I should say that Los Angeles um, has um, a good set of laws protecting people and lawyers to help them. So about two thirds of evictions are extra legal. Um, and so we're talking about basically all evictions, both legal and illegal. Our starting point was the number of renter households in LA County who've lost all their income and receive no replacement income. Uh, we were able to get near real-time unemployment data from the state that included demographic and industry data. But for purposes of this study, we assume that no one who received unemployment, especially with the CARES Act supplement, would be evicted. And we focused entirely on people who had lost their jobs, have no income, and no replacement income and based on census data, essentially no resources on which to rely. Um, historically, about one third of unemployed people have not applied for unemployment. In LA, that may be higher because 13% uh, of the workforce here is undocumented and ineligible for those programs. So combining those numbers and the census data on rental households, we estimated that there were about 365,000 renter households with no income at all. 
the great majority of whom had no uh, no financial reserves. And those uh, renter households included 558,000 children, more than a half a million children. All of those households are at very high risk of eviction. They have uh, not paid rent for quite a long time, and uh, all evictions have been frozen by the State Judicial Council. Uh, the freeze was set to expire uh, on August 3rd, but it's been postponed by the Chief Justice. Um, one thing and with respect to legal evictions through the legal system is that tenants without lawyers essentially never win. And it's likely that, as I say, 365,000 rental households are likely to, to lose their housing. Of course, not everyone who's evicted becomes homeless or remains homeless for any extended period of time. Um, our research has so shown, and that of other people has shown, that people avoid homelessness primarily by relying on family, friends, and a social network that can accommodate them for at least a period of time. But in this crisis, there are two limitations of the social networks of, of poor people or people who've lost, most likely to have lost their incomes without income replacement in this crisis. Uh, the first is longstanding, which is that the social networks of poor people are other poor people. And the second is that social networks are like insurance. They assume that not everyone in the network is facing disaster at the same time. And in low-income communities across America, and especially in Los Angeles, every social network is under extreme stress. So this makes it difficult to estimate how many unhoused people will become homeless. One thing we do know is that before COVID-19, every month in LA County, about 10,000 people were falling into homelessness uh, each month. And only about 1,000 of those remained homeless for any extended period of time. That's based on a very large administrative data set and uh, over many years of experience. So our most conservative estimate assumes that one in 10 evicted households will become homeless. I think that's probably um, uh, very conservative. And that leads to a projection of about 36,000 homeless households and about 56,000 children. There have been other uh, estimates of the number of evictions um, that we're likely to see in various uh, places based on regression techniques. But regression techniques don't work very well for discontinuities like the situation we're in now. Uh, the most uh, often cited model based on regression and unemployment data would have predicted that the increase in LA County of homeless people last year would have been 65 people. Uh, actually, it was 7,500 people. So that model is uh, disconfirmed uh, in this particular case. We have now at the Institute uh, pivoted to uh, new reports uh, that we hope to release in the next uh, few months or few weeks, I should say, uh, on how to uh, slow the rate of evictions and also to uh, prepare a system of interim housing that will be better than what is um, otherwise available, which would be uh, self-help encampments or Hoovervilles, uh, the sort we saw in the 30s, or things that uh, for which there is some formal planning uh, done either at the United Nations for refugee camps or at FEMA for catastrophic events. And from the perspective of very low income people in the most expensive housing market or the second most expensive housing market in LA, uh, this, is, um, this is a real catastrophe. It certainly is. is. Yeah, and it certainly underscores the importance of the work that all of us are doing together to get Congress to act to prevent this kind of an increase in homelessness uh, and evictions in LA and across the country. Um, so Gary, thank you for for sharing. Thank you for doing this work. Thank you for sharing it. We have a couple requests to see these numbers that you've shared. So if you could put in the chat box the link to the report, um, that would be helpful. Um, actually, if people just go or search on the Luskin Institute, it'll be on the homepage. It's on the slide that's in front of you now. Or email me at the email that's on the uh, that's on the uh, Thing and I'll put it in now. The, the length okay. of the report is a little long. Okay, great. All right, thank you. And we'll we'll send it out with follow up uh, follow up email as well. Thank you, Gary. 
Okay, our next speaker um, is Molly Jacobson from Virginia Housing Alliance to talk about some of the work that they're doing in Virginia to stop eviction proceedings. Molly, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, hi, this is Molly, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, so in terms of um, eviction proceedings, um, we recently, um, the government, or I'm sorry, the governor uh, requested an extension on the eviction moratorium through June 28th and um, that was passed or allowed. Um, and the reason uh, for the extension was so that we could work on our rent relief program, um, which will be, uh, not ours, I'm sorry, the state is launching a rent relief program, which um, they're hoping to launch in July. Um, and that will be created using some of the CARES Act money. Um, in terms of some other COVID um, items. Um, since March, uh, VHA has been convening a weekly call with our state industry partners, which include um, the state financing agency, government administration, um, and various providers and non and for profit partners. Um, and this has just been super helpful in getting updates from what's going on on the ground. Um, in terms of evictions, we have heard from some of our partners that they are fearful of what will happen when the eviction moratorium um, happens. So we have heard that there are some, or a lot of eviction um, filings queued up for when that moratorium ends. Um, but yeah, the, we've been having these calls since March and we've had a couple um, focus groups, subcommittees come out of those. Um, um, let's see. Um, in addition to those calls, um, we also recently had our virtual housing day to speak with our congressional delegation um, where we did highlight some of the housing issues that were particularly important to focus on given COVID-19 and evictions and rent relief were definitely um, up there for things that we would like our delegation to care about and to focus on. So I believe that is it. Hey, thank you, Molly. There's a couple questions. Um, one asking about, about whether there's a possibility of an additional moratorium extension in Virginia, whether that's something that you're working on? Um, in terms of an extension, well, we, um, we did receive one through June 28th. Um, yeah, haven't, the question is whether you're working to extend that further. I have not heard anything. Oh, um, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, Oh, I guess some of our state or some of our partners are asking for an extension beyond this one. Um, okay. Yeah, I see a few people putting in the in the box that there's a statewide call for an extension. Um, and one other question is whether the any of the rental assistance programs or other assistance programs that Virginia is creating assists undocumented renters. Um, that is a good question. Um, I do not know all the, we haven't received all the details about what is coming out within this rent relief program. Um, so I don't know. Um, I could look into that for you. Okay. okay, that would be great. Okay, Molly. Well, thanks so much for joining the call today. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Okay. Um, okay, so next I wanted to talk and I, I'm going to share this update on the uh, framework for equitable COVID-19 homelessness response. So this is something that um, you may all have received emails about either from us at the National Low Income Housing Coalition or from our partners at the National Alliance to End Homelessness, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, National Health Care for the Homeless Council, um, and National Innovation Services and the Urban Institute. 
So you've, you've hopefully seen an email announcing this framework. We also had uh, several weeks ago, we had Nan Roman from the National Alliance on a national call to talk about the framework. And we had Anna Leva from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities on one of our weekly state and local implementation calls to talk about a little bit more in depth. Um, but we wanted to share a little bit more information about the purpose for the framework, the thinking behind it, and what else we intend to do uh, as a set of national organizations working together on this. Um, and so really the reason why we created a framework and this project that we're all working on together is because Congress provided this unprecedented amount of funding through the CARES Act for uh, emergency solutions grants, $4 billion to jurisdictions across the nation to address the unique needs of people who are homeless. Um, so we know that states and localities, jurisdictions right now are figuring out how to spend these funds and that doing that strategically is very challenging. It's a, an unprecedented amount of money for an unprecedented public health emergency on top of an economic crisis. Um, and it's, it's coming to you at a time when many were, even before COVID-19, already overwhelmed with the issues of homelessness and, and certainly with the demands of the moment. So this group of, um, of partners, again, it's the, it's the National Low Income Housing Coalition, National Alliance to End Homelessness, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, and we're working very closely on this project with National Innovation Services, the Urban Institute, um, and two former directors of the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, Matthew Doherty and Barb Poppy. Um, and we came together to give communities a template for your homelessness response and to make sure that that template and that the work centers racial justice and racial equity in the approach. Um, and we're doing this again also because we really fundamentally believe that there is this incredible opportunity right now to really redo and recreate our homeless response system in a way that centers racial equity, in a way that ensures that everybody who is unsheltered can be brought into a shelter and that that shelter itself can be transformed into a very short-term place that's low barrier, no barrier, that's non-congregate, that's housing focused, um, and that people are quickly diverted from those shelters and back into permanent homes. And um, so the framework is, is the first of the materials and it's the one that really is gonna guide the rest of the work. And um, I'll ask somebody from the NLIHC team to put the link in the chat box for the framework itself. Um, and that framework lays out some of the action areas, the strategies, and the funding sources that are available. And then it, we suggest the order in which these strategies should be implemented. Um, and fundamentally, it's really laying out how communities can use these significant dollars to really transform their homelessness systems into ones that center racial equity, that are housing focused, that are short term, and that are public health oriented. Um, we have a set of values that overlays um, and undergirds the framework. The first value is a commitment to addressing racial and income disparities, right? We've talked at length on these calls about how homelessness and the pandemic really shine a light on racial and economic inequality in our country. And we need to make sure that we're using these funds in ways that eliminate racial disparities, and certainly that don't exacerbate them. Exacerbate them. Um, another value is to ensure that we are helping people with the highest needs first. People experiencing homelessness, people who are unsheltered, older, medically vulnerable, disabled, ill, these are people who should be assisted first. And we want to ensure that these ESG resources in, particularly, in particular are used for people experiencing homelessness before they're used for anything like eviction prevention. And of course, there are other funds available in the CARES Act also that we've talked about at length that are there to do eviction prevention. But these ESG dollars should really be targeted 
for people experiencing homelessness. Um, another value that uh, it um, that guides the framework is to ensure that housing people and linking them to any needed services is the goal. That's the end game, right? Putting them into a socially distanced shelter or, or putting them into hotels or motel rooms is a good start, but it's not enough. And clearly it's a, poorly, a, a poor public health strategy. Um, so resources, resources should be used to get people into homes. Um, and finally, recognizing that the work, this work is very big and it can't be accomplished by the homelessness system on its own. It's going to require a lot of new partnerships with housing and health departments, with the private sector, um, and all of these partnerships that are developed now can be helpful in, uh, in the work in the future. So the framework itself will be updating. Um, over time, we'll regularly update it and share those updates out. And we're also going to be over time um, uh, creating and sharing additional materials and tools. Things like making the case for why and how every community should focus their ESG CARES Act funds on people experiencing homelessness, on marginalized communities, on extremely low income households. Um, we'll be creating together a guide on how to implement equity-based decision-making processes, both at the community and the organizational levels, to make sure that people with lived expertise are at the table and are participating actively in making decisions. We'll be sharing briefs and videos that identify strategies to serve populations who have been historically marginalized and marginalized by COVID-19. Um, we're gonna put together a geographic targeting tool that will help identify specific neighborhoods where households have been heavily impacted by COVID-19 and by its economic impacts so that funds can really be precisely targeted to those communities where, where they're most needed. Um, and we'll also be putting together um, some tips, implementation tools for strategies like landlord engagement, uh, working with small landlords, shelter diversion approaches, um, and more. And as part of this work, um, there is an implementation working group that's led by National Innovation Services. Um, and they, this, this group is um, doing outreach to directly impacted people to ensure that their input is part of the design of all of these tools. So they are, we together are putting together um, virtual listening sessions with some of these impacted communities. And we would welcome all of your help um, for us to schedule these listening sessions with impacted populations. And we're focusing on Native, Black, and Latino people, on LGBTQ people, on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Uh, we're focusing on people who are involved in systems such as the foster care system, uh, with undocumented people. We're focusing on people with incarceration histories and on people living with disabilities, including mental health disabilities. So uh, each of these listening sessions will have about five to eight participants per session, and we'll be compensating uh, participants for their time in the listening sessions. So we'd love your help. If you have ideas, please reach out to Kim Johnson. Um, she can put her email in the chat box. You can also reach out to any of us at NLIHC, and we can help connect um, these folks with the listening sessions. And again, much more to come on the materials and on the plans and on the framework. And we really, all of us at the coalition, at the Alliance, at the center, with all the participating organizations, um, we really welcome input and ideas on you know, how the framework is working, how it can be improved, what other materials would be helpful for you in your work. So please do reach out. My email's up on the screen now. Reach out to me, reach out to any of us at the coalition. Um, reach out to partners that, or, or um, people that you have relationships with at those partner organizations. And uh, we're meeting um, 
what we call the leadership team. We're meeting every two weeks to talk about our next steps and make decisions on new resources. And we welcome your input for all of that. Um, I'm going to take a quick look and see if there are um, questions on this. Um, there's questions about timing for all of it. it and specifically on the geographic targeting tool, it's a great question. I, I can't give you a specific time right now, um, but I'd say on the next call, I think I can probably share a timeline for all of the materials that we're putting together um, so that you can have a, an idea of when they're coming. Of course, we recognize that all of this is needed urgently if it's gonna have the impact that we hope it will, because um, the money, while not available yet, hopefully will be coming soon, and certainly communities are already putting together their plans. So we intend to work pretty quickly on all of this and get materials out as fast as possible. Um, so, yeah, so there's other questions about the listening sessions um, specifically, and I'll ask you to reach out to Kim on those and she can respond uh, via email to um, ideas or requests on the listening sessions. So, um, so thanks. That's, that's it on the framework. Um, and now we have a little bit of time left to turn to a very important topic, which is what's happening on Capitol Hill and what do we all need to do to keep moving our policy priorities around $100 billion in emergency rental assistance, national eviction moratorium, $11.5 billion in additional ESG funds, and more. And how do we, how do we make sure, get those policy priorities across the finish line? So first I'll, I'll turn to Sarah from the policy team at NLIC to talk about latest updates from Capitol Hill. Sarah, I'll turn to you. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> the latest that we've heard is that the House and the Senate are still in a stalemate over next steps in negotiating a coronavirus package. Um, as Diane has mentioned earlier, the HEROES Act was passed out of the House with all of NLIC's top priorities in it. And we've been waiting on some indication from Senate leadership about when negotiations will happen. Um, we know that we are quickly coming up to the July 4th recess, which will last for two weeks, the week of July 6th and July 13th, in which the Senate will be on recess. And so that really means that there's very limited time between now and then to get any coronavirus package done. And we'll likely see final negotiations happen in the last two weeks of July. Um, we have been getting some positive indications, I'll say, from Republican offices about the need for rental assistance. So I want to thank everybody on the line for making, uh, reaching out to their Republican senators and uh, reiterating the need for rental assistance. Um, but we have yet to see something publicly um, uh, undertaken by Republicans on this end. We did see at a recent banking committee hearing, McSally from Arizona had mentioned her concerns about uh, the needs of renters. And we're trying to push her and other uh, Republican senators to be more vocal about the need for housing assistance. Um, we're continuing also to build support for the emergency rental assistance bill. Um, we have 39 Senate Democrats on the bill, but we're trying to target the remaining Democrats to get on board. So if you live in a state with, um, if your senators are Senator Cantwell from Washington State, Carper from Delaware, Warner from Virginia, Tester from Montana, Manchin from West Virginia, Jones from Alabama, or Cinema from Arizona, please continue to reach out to them and ask them to co-sponsor the bill. I'll also say that we initially get some uh, pushback from these offices. Well, we're starting to see that improve too. So we're hearing good progress from them about them reconsidering the bills and taking it up with their bosses. So keep pushing on that end. On the Republican side, our targets are still very much those um, Republicans who have been vocal on housing issues in the past or who face difficult um, re-elections this year, and so they might be more inclined to focus on housing. That includes Senator Collins from Maine, Portman from Ohio, Young from Indiana, Romney from Utah, Gardner from Colorado, McSally, who I mentioned earlier from Arizona, and Tillis from North Carolina as the very top targets for that. Um, before in, in the, the ability to get this final coronavirus package forward depends a lot on other 
uh, bills that are going to be taken up in the House and Senate in the next couple of weeks. So I think it's important for me to just very briefly mention some of those priorities that are coming forward. The first is that this week is very much going to be consumed by um, police reform discussions. We've heard that there's a possible vote on Wednesday, a procedural vote on Wednesday in the Senate about um, uh, a Republican-led Justice and Policing Act or their equivalent of that. Um, it's unclear whether or not there'll be enough votes to overcome that procedural vote and to vote on the substance of a bill or what exactly that would look like. Um, but we also know that the House is very uh, moving forward, likely um, this week as well, Thursday, on their Justice and Policing Act. So both of those are really consuming the discussion uh, on the Hill this week. Next week, we'll likely to see we'll be likely to see um, more action on an infrastructure bill. House Democrats have unveiled a 1.5 trillion dollar infrastructure bill called the Moving Forward Act. It combines three different bills that were produced by different committees. So a bill from the Ways and Means Committee on tax provisions, from the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee on uh, more traditional uh, infrastructure type projects. And then a bill with major investments in affordable housing from uh, the Financial Services Committee led by Chairwoman Waters. So I think it'd be helpful for me to share a little bit about the provisions that are in this infrastructure bill and to give you a sense of what we think about timing and it moving forward. Um, so the bill includes a lot of our top priorities for an infrastructure package. It includes $70 billion in public housing capital funds. $5 billion in the National Housing Trust Fund to build housing for people with the lowest income, a $1 billion for tribal housing and additional resources for home, CDBG, Section 202, 811, and rural housing. All of these are provisions that were included in the Housing and is Infrastructure Act that moved out of committee earlier this year, um, but we're looking forward to seeing it being voted on as part of this larger package. The bill also includes a number of tax provisions that impact housing, including uh, setting a minimum 4% floor uh, for the 4% credit of the low income housing tax credit. Um, it includes a basis boost for developments that are serving extremely low income households, as well as developments that are being built on tribal lands or in rural areas. Um, all three of those are provisions that the National Low Income Housing Coalition has been um, largely supporting. Uh, the bill also repeals qualified contracts, which is a loophole that's been used to undermine affordable housing, as well as um, an expansion and extension of the new markets tax credit, among many other provisions. Um, and I will say that it's really good to see on the traditional infrastructure package that, that that's, not, that's coming out of the TNI committee. There are a couple of provisions related to housing there too, and it, we're starting to see more um, collaborative efforts between folks who work in transit and folks who work in housing to, to try to overcome those uh, different sectors. And so we see provisions in that part of the bill that would help transfer transit-oriented development uh, properties to nonprofits and local housing authorities, uh, language that would encourage localities to include affordable housing in their transit-oriented development plans, and even uh, provisions that would incentivize localities to include, uh, to look at ways to preserve and create more affordable housing through zoning, um, all of which is really uh, great and important. We're gonna see a vote on that infrastructure bill likely before the July 4th recess. We've heard possibly next Tuesday for a vote. Um, so again, it's not to uh, distract from our coronavirus efforts, but just to give you a sense of what the timing is and what we're likely to see being voted on beforehand. Um, we don't think this infrastructure package is likely to pass this year, but again, we're really pleased to see that housing is a, a part of that starting point for negotiations in the House bill. Um, and then lastly, I'll just mention that the coronavirus um, efforts are also, ha also having an impact on appropriations efforts. We know that the House is going to mark up their transportation, housing, and urban development spending bill July 8th and 9th. Um, their plan is to mark up all of their committee bills, the 12 bills, by the end of July before August recess. Um, and so they have to really hustle to get through those appropriations bills before they can turn their attention back to the coronavirus package. On the Senate side, um, the 
other bills that I mentioned, including the policing bills, that's also pushing back the Senate schedule for appropriations. And I think they're very quickly losing time on their calendar to be able to take that up before the coronavirus package. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Diane. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Sarah. And I want to turn to Joey Lindstrom, also from NLHC, to talk uh, briefly, because we are out of time. Sorry, Joey. <laughs> but to talk about some actions that each of you can take to help us get the provisions of the HEROES Act enacted as soon as possible. Joey, please go ahead. Thanks, Diane. I will be super brief. I uh, just want to remind everybody that we have a couple of sign-on letters still going so that you can add your organization to the more than 600 throughout the country who have called on Congress to pass the Emergency Rental Assistance and Rental Market Stabilization Act, as well as the housing elements of the HEROES Act. Um, please, if you haven't signed on to those letters yet, do so immediately. Uh, we'll be sending updated versions of these letters to Congress a couple of times between now and the end of July. Uh, which is probably the earliest we can expect that the Senate is going to take action on a new spending package. Um, so please do sign on to those letters and please do um, promote them and share them with your network so that we can build more and more and more support. Um, Sarah mentioned earlier uh, that uh, we have a lot of thanks to offer to those of you who have been in contact with your members of Congress uh, because we have seen some softening of some of the Republican senators and we've seen some progress with some of the remaining Democrats who aren't yet on board with $100 billion. Um, if you haven't yet contacted your members of Congress, specifically your senators, please do so immediately. Do so even if they are Democrats who are supportive, because ultimately the Democrats will have to make some difficult decisions when it comes to negotiating a final package, and we want to make sure that housing is their top priority. Um, Sarah mentioned that senators are going to be uh, in their home districts for the next two weeks, and of course that'll be even more true when the calendar turns to August. So start thinking about ways that you can engage your members of Congress in inviting them to events that have, uh, you know, of course, masks being worn and appropriate social distancing. In many years, uh, elected officials going home at this time of the calendar would be um, packed fill, uh, have their calendars packed fill with uh, fundraisers and rallies and town halls and parades and so forth. But most of those events um, have been canceled. This presents a unique opportunity for those of us who are advocating for um, high priority uh, resources for housing in that um, some of these elected officials have uh, some openings on their calendar and they might be looking for something to do. If you can arrange a, a small scale meeting with residents or a small scale meeting with local advocates on housing issues, I think you'll find that many of the senators uh, who will be at home uh, will take you up on an invite to participate in a meeting like that, especially if they think you're, you're going to share it on uh, social media and sort of present it to an audience. So please think creatively about how you can engage your senators, especially in all of your members of Congress during times when they will be back in their home districts and NLIHC's field team as always is available to help as you uh, work through some of those ideas. Uh, that's it for me. Thanks, Diane. Great. Thanks so much, Joey. And the letters Joey is mentioning are really important and they have an impact. The letter that is supportive of the $100 billion in emergency rental assistance has over 640 organizations from across the country signed on and supporting that $100 billion. And just as one example of the impact that that has, Congressman Denny Heck in a recent uh, congressional hearing talked about that letter, talked about how broad the support for this proposal is, um, and entered the letter into the, the congressional record of the hearing. And he's talked about it multiple times since, about how that number of signatures on that letter really shows how um, broad and diverse the support for that provision is and how important it is. So please do keep signing on to those letters. It really makes a difference. Um, just a couple quick things that I want to talk about before we wrap up. One is that we had several people ask questions throughout the call today about how we decide uh, who our speakers for these calls will be and whether people can volunteer for that. Um, we certainly welcome, you know, the, the purpose of this call is really to share information from across the country. And we, if you have something to share, please reach out to anybody, start with the field team, um, but you can reach out to anybody at MLIHC and we'd love to hear from you and uh, find a place for you on a future agenda. Um, also to share, as you know, we have a number of working group calls uh, that meet throughout the week in between these national calls. 
And our next one is today, it's our next Tenant Talk live call. And that is a call that is designed uh, for uh, low income renters and resident leaders. Um, and so it's called Tenant Talk Live, and that happens today at six o'clock. And the topic for today's call is race, housing, and hope. And we have some great guest speakers. Vanessa German, um, who's from Pittsburgh, she's an artist and community activist. And Rashida Phillips, who's uh, a senior advocate and a training attorney at the Shriver Center, are gonna join the Tenant Talk Live call. Again, that's at six o'clock Eastern today and there's a link for that in the chat box and then we'll have also this week tomorrow we have our legislative working group call we also have our working with fema uh, group call on tuesdays and on wednesday we'll have our state and local implementation call so please as always you're welcome to join any and all of those um, and thanks so much again thank you for joining today thanks for all of your good and important work throughout the country and we'll talk to you all again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.